Hopefully. All right. Um, we'd like to welcome everybody watching on the web and on Facebook. Hello. Um, so, all right. Now, what was it? Hey, can you believe we're already talking about December 31st? It feels like the year has just like slid right, right through. I guess that's what that's what happens when when you have a uh, eventful church. Hallelujah. All right. All right. Let's well, let's begin with with prayer first. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this Bible study. We thank you, Father God, for being here, Father God. Um, we thank you, Father, that the heat works, the lights are on, and the money and the money to support this church is flowing. And we thank you, Father God. Now, Father, hide me behind the cross, Father God. Illuminate your word, Father God, so that we can receive. Father God, something that will change not only our lives, Father God, but those of the people around us, those, the people at work, Father God, those people in our families and the people we don't even know. So we thank you, Father God. We pray that you give sound blessings and traveling grace to our pastors and the group that is with them and us as we leave this evening. And we thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. I had to catch myself. I was already talking about leaving. Y'all cat that, right? We're gonna, we're gonna kick that, we're gonna cut that out of the out of the sermon, right? Right, 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 right. She would tell too. All right. I don't feel like I'm in the middle here. Hold on. We're just gonna have to like turn this a little bit. I got way too many microphones. Uh, do we have microphones in the room? Someone can go ahead and take care of that. You can go ahead and take one. Take the purple one because it matches your pants. Take the black one because it matches your pants. Hallelujah. All right. So uh, can anybody like give me feedback? Isaiah 27. Anything y'all caught? Anything y'all learned? Anything? Don't raise your hand all at once. Please, please, please raise your hand. You guys are all, you guys are too emphatic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I got one person saying there's too much. Let me let me give you a little little uh, little overview. Right. We talked about. Uh, God reaching back for his people, right? We talked about grace. We talked about how God wants to bring back people to a right standing. He's yearning for people to come back to a right standing. Hallelujah. Now, Isaiah 28, uh, I'm going to read from the NLT. And I'm going to get this. All right. Um, yeah, can I? Yeah. All right. Isaiah 28. Uh, say amen when you're there. If not, TVs will hook you up, right? All right. All right. It says, what sorrow awaits the proud city of Samaria, the glorious crown of the drunks of Israel? It sits at the head of a fertile valley. Thank you. But its glorious beauty will fade like a flower. It is the pride of a people brought down by wine, for the Lord will, bring, will send a mighty army against it, like a mighty hailstone in a torrential rain. They will burst open it like a surging flood and smash it to the ground. Now, it's an interesting... So automatically we kick off, we, we jump right into this chapter with God seemingly upset with somebody, right? Let me just tell you, it's probably not the best way to start a chapter. From from us point of view, hallelujah. Let's not start the chapter with God telling me how much he's upset with me. But, um, yeah, right? Because, I mean, you, listen, I, and we're going to get there. I'm not going to get ahead of myself. But let's let's focus on some aspects of, the, of these verses, right? So in, in verse 1, it says, What's our way? It's the proud city of Samaria. Samaria is Israel. It's the capital of Israel, actually. Once the Israel had been divided into Israel and, Ju and Judah, right? We're tracking? And there's a little bit of background to this. Uh, it says, the glorious crown of the drunks of Israel. Now, you got to be... I, dang, he putting out all of their business. In one verse, he just lays out everything. He says, what sorrow awaits, what, what bad things are coming for those drunks in Israel. Now, he goes on to say, it sits at the head of a fertile valley. So we understand that Samaria had some goods, right? And, but its glorious beauty will fade like a flower. It's the pride of a people brought down by wine. So basically, we're talking about a drunk people 
who are about to experience a real sorrow because all of their treasures are about to fade away. Now, if you look at this from, 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 from the shallow level, we're probably talking about people who got a little consumed on wine. But let's go a little bit deeper than that, shall we? Can we be drunk with things other than wine? Can we be drunk with things in general? And I'm not talking about like intoxication. I'm talking about uh, I'm drunk on my car. I'm drunk on my TV. I'm drunk on my house. I'm drunk. I mean, we can continue on and on and on and on and on. What are some things that we can be drunk by? Oh, I'm so glad because I asked a question. You already raised your hand. Go ahead. There's a microphone right there. Go right on ahead. You already raised your hand. You're going to have to now. Ooh. Yeah, you're going to. I want you to grab a microphone to say that. Minister Justin, can I can I read the um, message really quick and tell you what I can get drunk off of? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, it says, doomed to the pretentious drunks of Ephraim, shabby and washed out and seedy, tipsy, sloppy, fat, beer belly parodies of, I think it's parodies, of a proud and handsome past. Watch closely, God has someone picked out. Someone tough and strong to flatten them. I could have went over to, um, yep. I apologize, I went to two. But other things that we can get drunk off of is um, ourselves, like not spending enough time in the Word, but spending more time on like social media, watching TV. So just like doing other stuff instead of giving more time, having more intimacy with God and Holy Spirit. I was going to say the same thing, whatever kind of social media. Yeah, I, you know, so leave this up because I'm going to get to that here in a second. But we can be drunk on a lot of stuff. It doesn't have to be alcohol. Now, one interesting aspect, and I think the reason why that it's elaborated here is because alcohol will take you out of your destiny. It is one of the very few things. It's it's something that they want to elaborate because, and and maybe it's to open up a brighter aspect, a broader aspect that when you get drunk on stuff, it can alter your mindset. It can alter your destiny because it takes you and gears you in a different direction than the way God wants you to be. It can take you, and when you when you start trusting in that house and those finances and the world system. The pride of life, I think, as Paul once said it. We can be so drunk on stuff that we don't even realize we're veering towards the right. We're veering towards destruction, as someone just said, who wasn't on a microphone, so not, no one else ever was able to hear them. But I like what the message says. It says, watch closely. God has someone picked out. Someone tough and strong to flatten them like a hailstorm, like a hurricane. Aren't we dealing with hurricanes in the U.S. right now? I just, I just read about that. And to be honest, that hurricane, there was, a, uh, there was a house being constructed on the beach. And a reporter looked at it and said, that house just flattened. Just gone. And, and see, the, the interesting thing is, is that we have a modern day aspect of what God was trying to do. Now, was, there's no such thing as coincidence. So I think God, it's perfect timing that God would elaborate like that because we look at this, people are getting out of the way of a hurricane right now. And, and, and God is saying right here, it says, God has someone picked out someone tough. I can read from this side now. And strong to flatten them like a hailstone, like a hurricane, like a flash flood. One handed, he'll throw them all to the ground. I don't know. They must have been drunk on some stuff. If, if, if God is going to one hand smack them, put a little baby powder on it, whack, right to the back of the neck. For the Lord will send a mighty army. Oh, that's verse 2 in the NLT. Let's go back to the NLT. The proud city of Samaria, the glorious crown of the drunks of Israel, will be trampled beneath its enemy's feet. It sits at the head of a fertile valley, but its glorious beauty will fade like a flower. Whoever sees it will snatch it up as an early fig is quickly picked and eaten. And another interesting little imagery God plays on this. Figs in that part of the world don't ripen until August. When you have a fig that ripens early, it is considered a delicacy. 
you automatically like you know, you ever seen those kids that don't wait for something to ripen all the way up so they're just like rip it off you know it's like an apple and it's still green but they're still ripping it off don't wait till it's red god is saying that i've got somebody like a hurricane that's going to that's going to rip all of your all your treasures away verse 5 then at last the lord of heaven's armies will himself be israel's glorious crown he will be the pride and joy of the remnant of his people. He will give a longing for justice to their judges. He will give great courage to their warriors who stand at the gates. I think it's easy for us to understand. Israel got away from God. And, and one aspect of this is, simply put, God will never turn a blind eye to his people doing bad. This might help some prophets who are like, God, why aren't you doing nothing? Why are you letting these people do this? You have something to comment, don't you? I can see it. She's like raising her hand. But this might help. You ever seen those people that are crying out to God? God, why are you being quiet? Why are you doing this? would in some ways comfort them. It tells them that God is not staying quiet. God is not turning his back to what they're doing, God is not staying silent to what they will do. Because if you understand, silence is conformity. God will never conform, right? So I think, and, and at least going this far, it's a strong statement God is making. If you get too drunk on stuff other than me, I'll rip it out. Right? Go ahead. First, he will give a longing for justice to their judges. I love that because he's, he's going to bring judgment, but, he, but his heart is he wants us back. Yeah. He wants us back. I mean, the whole purpose is for us to turn to him. You're getting further into my teaching. Okay. <laughs> his teaching. Okay. You go. You go. Absolutely. You are right. Go ahead. Oh, about that, maybe uh, say something Dante. Dante. Um, she, she took what you said? Man. I, I was about to say, all I was going to say was, you know, as a people, we want God to, to quickly bring judgment on others and other things. Yet God has been gracious, merciful, and kind to us. And when we're trying to force his hand to judge, we should likewise think of ourselves because at, at some other time, it was us. And so thank God that we're not God <laughs> because God doesn't hastily move um, at our beck and call. He moves in his perfect timing. And so he's, he's, he's showing his grace and his mercy, but he's also showing that he is a, a just God and he will bring judgment. Um, surely if he'll bring judgment on his people, you know, how, how much more? That do we think that we're not going to be dealt with? But it will be in his timing because he's a just God. He is not a harsh God. And you know, I, I think it's, prophetess is always saying, uh, God will bring judgment first to his house. And it's kind of perfect. I mean, it, 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 you got to admit, it, this is the puzzle piece that fits right into, into it because it, God is dealing with his house. God is dealing with his people. He's saying, Israel, I got an odd against you. you, you you've you taken your eye off the ball. You've focused on too many other things except for me. You think that the produce that comes out of the land will sustain you. But you don't own that. You don't create that. You don't design that. Go ahead, Sister Marty. You, know, you got to have a microphone, don't you? And, 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 I, and it, it's perfect because God's saying, well, hold on, if you don't come back to the source, I'm going to have to correct the thing, right? Sister Marty? Do you ever notice that when you go into, in prayer or you even fast about a situation about somebody that you may be having some type of turbulence with, that God always points back at you about your certain behavior, what you can do better? Or, it's always like he addresses you in that term. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but um, I know that's what normally happens anyway when I'm judging someone else's actions or something that's so forth. And I'm frustrated by how they're treating me. He always shows me in the midst of it first. 
I, you know, and uh, first of all, who are you trying to who are you trying to cut? It ain't me, is it? it? Ain't me, is it? All right, we good. We I good. Was we just good. Speaking for my <laughs> own lessons. So this, so this question is to those out there who who want to cut somebody in prayer. No, you got to remember, God is God is grace. God has grace. Remember, he's he's slow to anger. But once he does get angry, it's like a hurricane, baby. But God is, and I think that, and I remember when I was when I was dealing with some stuff and I was like Lord Jesus you can just cut that person right off you can just 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 take it out and God's like what well, hold up dude I'm grace what are you and, and you know God's like well I'm grace what are you let's not go back to the crusades here brother let's let's put on a little love right because in all intended purposes, God's like, listen, I'm the one who died on the cross. I'm the one who shed the blood on Calvary. So what right do you have to tell me to cut somebody? And what you see here is, is God getting to the point where it's like enough is enough. My grace does run out for, the, for you. My grace does, is not forever. I will not turn a blind eye. If you keep, but you see how God is. God's like, hey, I'm letting you know, you still got some time. You can get out of it if you turn back to me. And yeah, so uh, we got to walk in grace and love because uh, it's like uh, revenge is mine, said the Lord, right? You let God handle the correction piece. You just continue to love them and and, and of course, there, there, are, there are the differences. There are points where it comes to, like uh, suffer not a witch to live kind of deals. But that's extreme, and God wants us to be balanced, right? Go ahead. I was also going to say, um, Minister Justin, that one thing that really, really helps me is not acting my flesh is... Um, you know, our leaders talk about more is caught than taught. And, you know, if I'm going about my day, especially where people are going to see me a long time in the workplace and stuff, profess my love for God, and how to be Christ-like, and then I get tested with a situation where I can react negatively, then that person who's watching me could be like, oh, you just faking and shaking, you know. So... I actually had a situation happen this morning and a coworker of mine, she was like, man, I would have said so-and-so and so-and-so. And I was just like, you know, all my time with Jesus throughout the day is what helps me to counteract it and not give in to that. And it made me just have a self-check like, man, like people, you don't are really paying attention to what you're going to do and what you're going to say in certain situations. And it just makes me, you know, that self-check, that prophet is now always say for us to do with ourselves. We're talking about corporate America. Let's just be honest. People are going to be people. I've come to the conclusion being in corporate America that people are going to be people. Some people are going to try and test you. As you just, that's just what it is. That's how it is. If you get surprised about it, you should have known better. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. And not specifically to you, necessarily. I, I, but this is what I've learned. So I, I, I had one instance. I wrote on my whiteboard. Don't cuss in my cubicle. I mean, just simple. I thought it was clean. Guy comes walking in, erases it, and says, cuss in my cubicle. And, you know, and, and, but listen, people do that, but then they see you reading your Bible at lunch on your own time. And then, and then they see you not cussing at all. And they see you walking in with a cheery disposition and, and, the, and the love of Jesus within you, right? This is, this is how people... I hate to break it, but love is what causes people to come back to Christ. A Holy Spirit is what causes people to come back to Christ. The love of Jesus Christ is what causes people to be convicted and to try and find out what you got because the world ain't, the world ain't got what we got. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Um, I want to say that we have to remember that we are spirits first. Um, 
So when when people when you say that people yeah people are going to be people what people are going to challenge you the spirit is challenging the spirit within you, and that's like a one on one thing that I learned in the occult. We were taught to challenge people to test them to see how far they can go because when that when you, they allow that door to be opened then we can place curses and demonic spirits within them. So just to remember you know yeah we we have that's why we have to get our mind our will and our emotions in check. But like Prophetess and Pastor Adam says, we're, all, we're spirit first, housed in the body with the soul. So it's just something that we need to be mindful of. That's why, that's yeah, why, stop that's, looking at the fleshly aspect. That's why you turn your head and say, I bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. Why? Well, and, and, and you keep at it. And you don't let up. And you keep, you keep saying it, you keep saying it, and you keep saying it, and you keep saying it. I'm telling you what, I told my wife this week, I said, I think I've said the name of Jesus about a million times trying to get this enemy off of me. And, and, and guess what? The enemy does move on the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Now, I wanted to share a, a similar scenario at my previous job um, to where, like, they would always, you know, say little things like, they never see me upset or anytime there was an issue, I always gave a, you know, a, a Christian response, but not even necessarily Christian, but it was always bringing something positive and something good out of it. And so they were, so one day I went home, because when I left that day, where they were just, you know, messing with me, you know, saying little things about like how I'm just always happy. So I came in the next day, my desk was, you know, stuff was moved around and everything. And all I did, I, was, I just chuckled. You know, I was like, y'all are just so funny. And so they were just waiting. I guess they was expecting me to get upset. And I said, I just love y'all. I said, yeah, I did. And they just like, we cannot make you upset. You know, and I said, because you're not. I said, I got the glory of God on me. So it's nothing that's going to bother me. And, and, and I think that really took to them more it's just because it started coming to me more when it came to things that they were dealing with i noticed they always would come to me since i always had a positive outcome and then usually i give them a word and so but yeah now, now i have to tell you the 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 people that will test you the most are the ones in the in the end will be the most huh oh yeah and, and, and from my own experience, they're the ones who don't want you to leave when you get a new job. Because uh, I'm telling you right now. And, you know, what kind of person wants to try and get you upset? That don't make no sense. Okay. Listen, we're going to get back on, on text here. Uh, huh? Verse 5. Then at last, the Lord of heaven's armies will himself be Israel's glorious crown. Now, Isaiah himself shifts. He's not talking about Israel of, uh, that, that was drunk. He's talking about Israel, Judah, that lower country. Geographically, not spiritually, physically. He will be the pride and joy of the remnant of his people. He will, he will give a longing for justice to their judges. It seems to me that Judah was watching what was happening to Israel and saying, God, how long are you going to be silent? Isn't that, isn't that akin to some people today who have Christians on their job site who continue to cuss, who continue to fornicate, who continue to just decide not to go to church? I mean, come on, how easy is it to go to church? And then you just, let me not get on a tangent. And, and, and this stuff, we have this situation in our lives. My, the, the biggest challenge we as the remnant of Jesus Christ have is against the people who, who confess that they are of Jesus Christ and yet do not live it. You, you choose not to accept Jesus Christ, I respect, I respect you because you are loud and proud about it. And hey, that's your decision. But when you go to church, when you do these things, and then you have no problem shacking up, you have no problem, no problem swinging with your wife, and you have no problem doing everything else under the sun, that's when we have an issue. And it feels like that is what Judah was experiencing. Hmm? All right. 
And, and that's, and that's kind of, in verse 6, he will give a longing for justice to their judges. He will, be, he will give great courage to their warriors who stand at the gate. Listen, when your boss backs you up in a meeting, don't you feel a little, little like, oh, that's my boss right there. That's my, that, that's my boss. I had that experience. I looked at my boss and said, you deserve a raise. Because that right there, mm-mm. I was like, and, and I'm sitting there waiting. I'm like, is she going to do something? And then, she, and then she said something. I was like, that's my boss. You can't take her. I don't want to go nowhere. Hashtag blessed. That is what, and these warriors were like that. God, are you going to do something? And God's like, huh, I'm going to give them ample time to turn back. But I got this. Which I think is what, you know, when it comes down to it, if there was a title for this, I got this. Now, however, Israel, remember Israel's Judah at this point, is led by drunks who reel with wine and stagger with alcohol. The priests and prophets stagger with alcohol and lose themselves in wine. They reel when they see visions and stagger as they render decisions. Their tables are covered with vomit. Filth is everywhere. Who does the Lord think we are, they ask. Why does he speak to us like this? Are we little children just recently weaned? He tells us everything over and over, one line at a time, one line at a time, a little here and a little there. Why do you think God keeps repeating the same thing over and over and over and over? Typically, it's because you haven't gotten it. I hate to break it to you, but God ain't going to give you deep revelation if you can't follow the shallow stuff. Hallelujah. And so we, we understand Judah was looking at Israel saying, they're, they're overboard, God. But God, in his right stand, in, in, his, in his desire to be right standing with everyone, says, Judah, you're not sinless. You're not above board to the point, uh, or as, they, as I remember in, in Transformers, nobody is above reproach. Because God holds everybody to the same standard, which I think is, is neat because we're looking at the world saying, saying this has got to be corrected, God. But God's saying, don't forget. Don't get so high above yourself that you forget that, what, that you're dealing with stuff too. And then, so verse 11. Now, so now God will have to speak to his people through foreign oppressors who speak a strange tongue, strange language. God has told his people, here is a place of rest. Let the weary rest here. This is a place of quiet rest, but they would not listen. So the Lord, so the Lord will spell out his message for them again, one line at a time, one line at a time. Now, can I be honest with you? I, I don't know where I would be if God said something once and then just was like, eh, done with you. Done. Deuces. I'm out. I, I, I feel blessed that God is willing to repeat himself, that God has the patience with us, right? And, and I, and, so, and a, little, and a little here and a little there, so that they will stumble and fall. They will be injured, trapped, and captured. Therefore, listen to, the message, listen to this message from the Lord, you scoffing rulers in Jerusalem. You boast, we have struck a bargain to cheat death and have made a deal to dodge the grave. The coming destruction can never touch us, for we are built a strong refuge made of lies and deception. You can't get past God. No one can. If there, it, I, it, is, it is, is foolish to believe that the things of this world can protect you from the things of God, from the judgment of God. Pretty simple, right? Don't need to really go into it. Therefore, Verse 16, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. I will test you with the measuring line of justice and the plumb line of righteousness. Since your refuge is made of lies, a hailstorm will knock it down. Since it is made of deception, a flood will sweep it away. I will cancel the bargain you made to cheat death. I will overturn your deal to dodge the grave. When the terrible enemy sweeps through, you will be trampled to the ground. Again and again, that flood will come, morning after morning, day and night, until you are carried away. What is that foundation stone? What is that cornerstone? 
Did Isaiah know that he was talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? Did, did, I don't know that, that it, it's not clear, but I'd venture to say that, the, that because God speaks in present and in future tense, Isaiah may have never known that he was talking about the one who would take away our, our, our contract with death that was made by Adam. He would take away the things that hold us down, that keep us in that drunken state and keep us in God. And, and, and it's so eloquent. He says, you're going to be knocked by the flood. But if you're tied to the foundation of Jesus Christ, you cannot be moved. Amen? I got one amen. I'll take it. I'll take it. Because, and, and let's, let's, let's play a little here. It says that uh, you, can, you cannot cheat death. You cannot, you, if you are, build your foundation on a foundation of sand, you will be swept away with a hurricane. But if you put it on the rock, the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ, what can, what, what can test you? And, and if death does knock at your door, and... I mean, Jesus Christ went to hell, kicked down the devil's door, took the keys to sin and death. My God has the keys to sin and death. To die is gain. It means I don't have to pay the IRS no more money. And to, to die is gain. I, because, and listen, if I, if, I ha, if I never have to think about another bill, I'll be good. To die is gain. Sister Marty. That just thinks that this morning I was talking to my son. Um, to see, trying to get him to understand a little bit of thing. And while I was in the room talking to him, God just keeps bringing me back to grace. And the re just giving me a deeper revelation. And I think I even posted it on Facebook today. And I said, to understand that grace keeps us, but the will of God protects us. So I was giving him an illustration as like, I, I couldn't understand why, how I got hit by a car while I was praying. And I didn't understand that until now. I've been going through prayer and stuff that grace is what kept me. But being out of the will of God, it kept me from dying, but it didn't keep me from getting hit. See, being in the will of God keep, protects me. So if that car would have came around, it would have missed me. But because I went to the club the night before and I got drunk and I had, I was outside smoking a cigarette before the young lady came to me to get prayer. But because I still knew who God was, I still ministered to her in the midst of that. Grace is what kept me. And so that's just exciting. I, that's my testimony. Y'all been happy, happy and excited all day because now that I understand that, it put me back in the fear of the Lord. To understand, to get me on a deeper path of, yeah, you're right, because I got a left big leg, small right one. I'm cool. I'd rather be protected. But let's, but let's try to remember something. You got to be in the will of God. You get outside the will of God. I'm, I'm, hey, uh, that's like not having insurance. Okay? Now, let's be honest. Uh, you go at that level. I go one deeper. I used to tell people all the time. They'd be like, Justin, let's, let's, go, let's drive down to Taco Bell. I'm like, you got insurance in that car? Because I ain't created no opportunity for the enemy to take me out. You forget that mess. Because, because it, and let me break it down for, the, for those who may not understand. Insurance is a law, is a law, a law abiding, in, a law abiding citizen has insurance on a car. It's the law. You have to have it. When, and you have to obey the laws of the land, as Sister Kiara just said. So when you don't have insurance, you're, you're, you're going against the law of the land. God said, follow your, follow the rulers of your land. So when you don't have insurance in your car, you're not abiding by the government, which means you're not abiding by God. Because having insurance is not going against the will of God. But let me just be honest with you. So when I went, and I, and I still do it. I won't get in people's cars. I don't know if they have insurance. They could be lying to me. And I ain't created no opportunity to be taken out. I'm not ready to, I'm not, I know my time is not up to, to die. Believe me. Huh? So is speeding. Everybody say, ouch. Ouch. I get confident. I, and so you cannot create opportunities for the enemy. So you got to stay in the will of God. Right? Sister Kiara, you got something? 
The other thing that stuck out to me was when Sister Marty said that the, the lady needed prayer. So what we have to remember is that regardless, God can use anything. If he can use a donkey, he can use us, even if we are in or out of the will of the Father because he's still God. And he's not going to allow someone else to miss the opportunity to get ministered to because of a bad decision that we've made. Okay, that does not mean that if you have experienced alcoholism that you go to the, cl that you go to the bar trying to bring people to Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. But I, I, I definitely wanted to fill in that gap right there, that, that possibility, okay? Let's be honest. If you ain't delivered and, and you ain't got some years on you, that might not be your ministering platform. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Yeah, um, what you and Kiara were saying, because, um, you know, my, my neighbor, Todd, the one that passed away, when he gave his life to Christ because me and him used to smoke cigarettes together. That's how I was able to lead him. But once he started watching GBFIC online, he asked me, why do you still smoke? So, you know, God will come back. You know, if he has to get you delivered through someone else, it could be the very person that gave his life to Christ. So it's just like when you, when you give your life to Christ, yes, you receive a measure of faith, but it's up to you to build that faith. And your faith is what keeps you in the will. Ain't it like God to, to use, don't you know that smarts a little bit when you, when you're like, man, I'm going to bring them to Jesus Christ. And then they're like, um, excuse me, what are you doing? That smarts a little bit. I've had that experience that, that did not feel good. All right. Verse 20, the bed you have made is too short to lie on. The blankets are too narrow to cover you. This is wordplay, imagery. Jesus, God is saying in your current state, you cannot depend on these things. It's not enough. You need the cornerstone. How many, how many of us are thankful for the cornerstone? Come on. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for you, cornerstone. Because that bed was way too short for me. But see, and that's how I love is, is Jesus Christ, and I'm going to play a little bit with this. Jesus Christ not only took away that bed that was too short, but he ended up giving his bed for us. Oh, come on. I, and, and that bed is sonship with God. That, that, that bed is right standing with God where Adam was before he made that mistake. You notice how I did not say Eve made that mistake. I said, Adam made that mistake. Ain't it like our God to put us right back where we should have been all along. So he said, so again, he said that the bed you have made is too short to lie on. The blankets too narrow for you to cover, but the bed that I have for you is just right. The Lord will come as he did against the Philistines at Mount Perzim and against the Amorites of Gibeon. He will come to do a strange thing. He will come to do an unusual deed. God is talking about the, 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 the anger, the, the, the justice that he's about to bring upon his people. It's a strange thing to him. You look at the Greek gods, they love destruction. They love war. Every God, every God that man has ever theorized and tried to create is always about the utter destruction of man through sin or through violence. But God says it's a strange thing that I have, to, I have to put you into oppression, that I have to put you in to, into bondage to get you right. If, if I were to expand this a little bit, God is saying, I'd rather you just stay with me and we don't have to go through this. Now, any parent out there ever said, it hurts me way more than it hurts you? No, I, I think they might need to like apologize for lying because it hurt way more over here. I'm gonna, not going to lie. But I understand now because in their love, they don't want to have to do this. But they know they have to. But why do they have to? I'm going to give one of them images back there. It says, I know you ain't talking while I'm teaching. Mm. All right, 
So he says he will come to do an unusual deed. I'm here to tell you, God would rather not have to correct you. But God will. Even, it is, even if it is unusual to him. Go right on ahead. You got a microphone? Nope, go on. As a matter of fact, we should actually um, take a sign to count it as joy when we are corrected too because, you know, God also says in his word that, that I correct those whom I love. And so um, if you're receiving correction from God, you know, now is not the time to, to be woe is me, but it's to celebrate because then it's like, yay, I'm st he loves me. I'm still within, <laughs> within his grace, still within his mercy, but it's those times where you do something wrong and you don't receive correction and everything still just seeming willy-nilly where you really got to stop and say, okay, um, is my foot in the door or have I, have I shut it? <laughs> well, let me just tell you right now, this don't feel like love what I'm reading up above, right? It doesn't feel like love, right? I mean, come on. He's saying he's a hurricane about to, do, about to annihilate everything. Come on. That don't look like love, even though it really is, right? Go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't know how many times growing up, I was like, oh, man, I'm on punishment, da, 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 da. But then I think about it now, being an adult, I'm like, I appreciate what my parents did because it taught me something. And this is the kind of the same situation. God is teaching us something. At the time, yeah, it's not going to feel good. <laughs> but when we look back, we realize what lesson did we learn. All right, now now we can't have this little microphone switch between the between the Carters back there. But I and, and and let me just be honest, exactly what is going on in these scriptures is exactly what I felt when I was getting corrected as a teenager. Just being I, I, just being honest, I thought the whole world was over because my CD player was taken. It was gone. I I couldn't watch TV. Oh, come on. Yeah, I can't, I, I'm locked in my room. The whole world is going to pass me by. I, and no, no, it's not as extreme as, as, as this may be, but, but we feel that just to compliment what you're saying. Go ahead. Aren't we glad, though? Where would we be if we weren't correct? Oh, yeah. I am. No. <laughs> no. Where would, aren't we glad because where would we be if we didn't have a God like that? If we didn't have a God who is willing to correct, who's willing to, to say, okay, hold up a second. You've had the candy for way too long, brother. We're taking that away. Right? Trinity wants to say something. Mute his microphone, please. <laughs> All right. Now, all right. Verse 22. For the Lord of the heavens armies has plainly said that he's, discern he's determined to crush the whole land. So scoff no more or your punishment will be even greater. Plain speak for us men out there. Take it like a man. You're done. Or, or a woman. Take it, take it in a gender, a non-gender specific way. If, if you keep, and, and this is, keep fighting against me, it's only going to get worse, right? So that, that's why you just fess up when it happens. That way, you know, it's not like it's, it's easy, right? All right, listen to me, verse 23. Listen and pay close attention. And this is, this is, this is going to sum it all up right here. Does a farmer always plow and never sow? Is he forever cultivating the soil and never planting? Does a farmer ever sow and not expect to reap? Does, it, does a farmer ever plan to reap but never sow anything? Does he, does he not finally plant his seeds, black cumin, cumin, wheat, barley, emmer, and emmer wheat, each in its proper way, each in its proper place? The farmer knows just what to do, for God has given him understanding. When God corrects us, he corrects us because he loves us and he's doing it for a reason. You will always know a mature Christian when they know how to take it in a non-gender specific way. Amen. You have grown up when you don't whine and cry and stay sulking for days and decide to get angry with the Lord because he corrected you or your pastors corrected you 
or your spiritual, spiritual parents corrected you. In fact, you want to know mature people? Mature people look at, look at them and say, okay, can I have another? Can I, come on, come on. This is growing. This is growing. Bring it on. God is saying, I, I sow because I plan to reap. I correct because there's a, re there's a reason for correcting. We have to trust in God and trust our pastors that the correction is for our greater good. Yeah. That, that's really good, Minister Justin. Um, what it made me think of is there's always um, um, a spiritual aspect to the natural. So if you can't receive correction in the natural, you really don't receive correction in the spirit. So if you can't receive correction from your shepherds, if you can't receive correction from another leader, then technically you really can't receive correction from God. And I think if we look at it in that manner, that'll help us mature quicker. So I don't know if everybody knows this, probably do. My parents have a farm, 40 acres. I'm not trying to, I don't want anything to do with the 40 acres, so that's not me boasting. Um, but they have uh, they have a number of animals, but they have one specific one that I think is very, very, very unique for this teaching. When you can't handle correction, you act like a goat. And I will tell you right now, goats say deuces, I'm out. They will go and do their own thing. They don't want nothing. They will not be obedient. I remember in a, being in a Dodge Durango, hanging on the side of it, trying to catch this goat, and he ran me all over 40 acres trying to catch him. And he would not quit. In fact, I, I, I apologize for anybody who thinks that I'm cruel, but I accidentally flew off the vehicle, head kneed him in the head, and he got up and ran right off again. And I'm like, seriously, you're not even gonna like, I mean like, you know, I know I'm, I know I'm rather slanky, but come on, that had to hurt at least a little bit. You will know people who cannot handle correction because they will not last long in this church. I hate to break it to you. You will not last long being a goat because you will always want to do your own thing. You will always want to, always want to have it your own way. But sheep know to follow the voice. They know. And you know, shepherds break the leg of break the leg of a sheep to, to teach a lesson. Don't wander off. They didn't do it because they want to be cruel. They did it to provide correction. And don't you just love, since we're talking about sheep, that God will always go for that one out of the 99. I love that. That's the cornerstone right there. All right, verse 26. The farmer knows just what to do, for God has given him understanding. We said that. A heavy sledge is never used to thresh black cumin. Rather, it is beaten with a light stick. A threshing wheel is never rolled on cumin. Instead, it is beaten lightly with a flail. Grain for bread is easily crushed, so he doesn't keep on pounding it. He threshes it under the wheels of a cart, but he does not pulverize it. The Lord of Heaven's army is a wonderful teacher, and he gives the farmer great wisdom. Here's the point. God provides right correction, not an overdoing. Our flesh wants to, wants to just, just rip out and say, why are you abusing me, God? Why are you doing this to me? It's not fair. It's, it's, it's not, it's, why, why do these people not have to deal with it, but I do? And, and God is saying, I don't beat wheat with a heavy stick. I don't, I don't, I don't treat you one way because I just want, I'm not an abusive father. Oh, if, if we understood that you would have, there is not loads of people who want a non-abusive father, a, a father that, a father that treats them well, corrects them well. But the thing people have, the thing that Christians have to understand is that you don't get one without the you get both. It's a two for a deal. And that's what we get. And that is awesome. Because if you want God, you want the whole package, right? So, 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 and I, I learned on, I learned early on that sometimes 
correction is necessary, even if you end up with a rug burn across your forehead. That happened to me. Yeah. Uh, deliverance is progressive. And and I and let me just tell you something. It's I I'm sure some I cannot make this statement wholeheartedly, but I, I I've been corrected a lot in this ministry. I and and a lot of times it was because I tried to find the the line where the boundary was, and see if I could cross it. Okay, let me be honest with you. If if I'm on a if I'm on a Daniel fast, you know I'm going to McDonald's to get some fries. No. We understand that? I would I would try, huh? Yeah. But 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 the the point is you want to go far, you you have to take the licking and keep on ticking, right? Right. So now so so what we understand from this is that God is God is saying it both in and out that I will provide correction. But just because I provide per- correction doesn't mean that it's your do- your end doing. That I provide correction because I want to see something greater in you, and prog- and correction is progressive. the The sixty year old is going to get corrected just like the eighteen year old. In fact, though, I I did wonder sometimes. I was like, it's getting pretty quiet in here. It's getting pretty quiet. But we have to understand that God is is if you want to go far in Christ. You're going to have to learn how to take some correction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And let me tell you something. When that correction comes, and it's like a hurricane, just tie yourself to the cornerstone. Hallelujah. <laughs> right. All right. So that, that is that. Does anybody, uh, please, feedback. Come on. Let, has anybody got any feedback? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I was, um. Minister Justin, I was just going to say that this uh, chapter from tonight, I've been um, having in my spirit the Romans 5, like that whole chapter, and it's talking about basically, you know, we was apart from God and we were justified once we gave our lives to God. And so just uh, we've been talking about like God rebuking us, correcting us and everything because he loves us like when... Um, just, I, I really was meditating on, um, verse three when it was just talking about tribulation produces patience, patience produces character and character produces hope. So three through five, almost might as well say, basically all the, all that correction and stuff, it produces these different characteristics in us to help us not only in ministry and in, in the body of Christ, but like here I was saying, in the natural, like it really does um, gear you for facing the world and other people head on because you're dealing with spirit. So um, just like it's it's not for nothing. It is all, It's God always has a reason for what he's doing for you wholly and individually. And yeah, you know, let's try to remember something. Um, God provides correction because he doesn't want you to waste time, okay? I, in my singleness, I was really geared towards not having sex. Now, I can say that. I, I passed the test. I, and, and, and people say, oh, well, Justin, I don't, I don't know if they say this for guys, but they say, Justin, you're a prude or, you know, whatever, it is, whatever the case is. Do you know what my single focus was? I don't want to have to redo the years that I lost shacking up with people. I, I, I hate to break it to you, but I'm not in the business. Listen, there is that scripture that says I will give back the canker worm, the palmer worm, and all that stuff. Skip that. How about we just do it right the first time? How about we just do it right the first time? Some, some, how do you say this? Some correction you don't have to have. If I, if I, if I put God first on my money, that means God doesn't have to come to me and say, do I need to take that money away? And, 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 and I had an experience. I wrecked my car. And the Holy Spirit came up and said, you kind of love that car a little too much. I had to put you in check. Now, God did provide me with another car, but I had three, two broken ribs off of that sucker. I'd rather not do that again. Let's not have that hurricane come down my road again. Hallelujah. You don't have to get this correction. 
Don't use Scripture as a way out of, of, doing, of doing bad. Yes, the, the palm worm and the canker worm can restore the years to you, but that's only if God says that they can restore the years to you. And let's be honest, if you if you deliberately being boneheaded about it, God may not God may say, oh, well, that sucks for you, dude. Um, I guess you're going to learn that lesson, aren't you? I'm sorry, I, it's just not in me. I've have seen my brother, I've seen family members do that. You know, you, let's be non-specific. I've seen family members do that. You, you can learn the experiences from other people. And that's what, and oh, it's just clicking back. That's what God was trying to tell Judah. Learn from Israel's mistakes. Don't make me come down there. Don't make me send this hurricane your way. And it was, truth be told, Judah had two issues because Egypt was, was south of them. And that was its own separate hurricane. So you could have the Assyrians, you could have Egypt coming, and it could have been rough. But, let, but just do right. Kill the flesh and walk it out. Yes, we will mess up, but you don't have to sin. You can, you can endure a season of non-sinfulness. I, I have been purpose-driven this week with, with and, I, and I'll say this, I have been purpose-driven with not exaggerating things. I will be honest with you. I told God, I don't want correction for being, because let's be honest, exaggerating is just another form of lying, right? And, and, and people do that, don't they? They love to exaggerate, make it sound better and all that stuff. And, and, and I caught myself. I was like, oh no, flesh, reel it back in. We ain't exaggerating this place. Why? Because I don't want that correction. I don't need that correction. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about your chest size, and you sound like you didn't got some whoopings like mine. Um, no, I think but, you got some whoopings like mine, because I've been having them for years. I'm a little bit older than you. I'm a lot uh, older than and, you, so I've been getting whooped a long time. But I think my version of chastisement as well is a purge. If you go back to, like, when you got whooped by your mother, some of those whoopings cause you not to do it again because of the the... The repercussions of it, you like, I don't want that no more. So sometimes those chastisements, they help purge it out of you as well a little bit faster, like you said, to shape up your character. So I also look at chastisements like God is just really whooping me as well, but also purging and cleaning me. Because sometimes that, that consequence makes me look at it and say, oh, that makes sense. That's why that happened. And then it makes me change it as well. Or go through some deliverance on the floor. <laughs> I, and you know, and, and forevermore, I, I want to declare when I'm getting correction, uh, my ladder will be greater. When I'm getting corrected, it means something good is coming my way. Because when I was getting, corre when I was getting corrected about, about uh, being Mr. Mac and Cheese with the ladies, it was because my wife was coming down the road. When I, when, I was, when I was flabbergasting and, and, and being exaggerative, it's because God was setting me up for greatness at my job. Because, because God will never use a dirty stop sign to stop people from going to hell. People can't see the stop sign if it's all dirty. We got to clean up. But the blessing is that when we get cleaned up, when we, when we start walking it out, that's when God pours out his favor. That's when God pours out his blessings. Because God never puts new wine in old wineskins. So this isn't all a doom and gloom chapter. This is saying, Judah, I got something good for you. But you got to clean it up. Israel, they kind of messed that up. They had the good stuff. They let it spoil. Go ahead. Like, hallelujah. There you go. <laughs> it wasn't on purpose. Oh, why did I praise when I was being praised about that? I said, hallelujah, that you muted my mic. But um, I just want to say that a lot of it, too, is like perceiving how you perceive the correction of God that comes for it. Um, when I look at the correction of God, I think of it as the process of me being untangled. Um, and the reason why I say that is because Proverbs 22 and 15 says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. And so a lot of times 
I get into a habit of, of cycles um, or loops, I should say. Um, I develop a process throughout the day, and then once that process occurs more than three times or three days in a row, past that point, it's like a set cycle, and everything else is blocked out like tunnel vision. And sometimes God gets blocked out like tunnel vision, but those trials and tribulations are there a lot of times to shake us from, out, from, from the tunnel vision, to shake us out of those loops, to shake us out of those cycles. But if we always view it as a process of us being um, detangled or untangled, so that God could then straighten us out instead of looking at it as um, I'm being beaten, abused. <laughs> then that's where God truly begins to move into our lives and, and change us for the better and move us towards that mark that he's been pressing us towards. So, uh, yeah, so, so we're just going to wrap this back in because I just heard it and uh, I'm, we're just going to wrap this in. Uh, Dr. Wright, meet the conditions. Hi. Now we know how we meet the conditions. We're his. I mean, we're, we're the body. We're his body. Like, that's our goal. Like, why are we getting corrected? We're, ref we're not individuals. We're reflecting him. We want to be like him. I was, I was just going to say what Anne-Marie said. And Kiara, um is we're meeting the conditions. So correction is like prophets always say, and when we get corrected, thank God because he's building our character. He's building our integrity. He, he's teaching, teaching us how to remain faithful. He's teaching us how to remain available, teaching us how to remain teachable. And so those are like the foundations, meet the conditions. What are, what they keep telling us the conditions for this house, you know, being a CIA, being fat and different things. So when correction does come, we're late. We're going back over that foundation to meet in the conditions of this house. Yeah, and and I'm going to get you here in, all the way in the back in a second. Be ready. And let's remember, we didn't come to Christ to get the favor. We came to Christ to be in the body. Let's not be like Israel. Let's not get caught up in the blessings that come with it. Let's stay focused on being the body. All right, br Brother Tim, and then we'll close. Well, it's like... Um prophet is an example with a diamond we we're like coal and so when we get chastised let's say let's just say there's a hundred levels of pressure that needs to be applied to make us a diamond when you get chastised that's another pound of pressure being pushed on you to get you to that diamond status every time you go through something and you learn from that mistake and you get, say, delivered from whatever you might have been struggling with, then you're that much closer to becoming a diamond shining bright. And everybody said, thank God for the pressure. Oh, come on. I, I don't believe it. Thank God for the pressure. Now, now you can't complain when he pressures you. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you, man. I have another. All right, so Father God, we thank you for this, uh, for this teaching. Lord, we, we know, Father God, that it was for such a time as this that we could understand that pressure is to gain. That pressure from you, correction from you, God, is, is because good things are coming our way. So we thank you, Father God, for that yawn, because we know deliverance is occurring in the name of Jesus. And we thank you. I, hey, listen, I, I, I get you. So we thank you, Father God, because I'm staying focused. We thank you, Father God, for all that you are doing, Father God, because the favor doesn't come without correction. The blessings don't come without the correction, Father God. And Father God, we are staying purpose-driven to be one body in unity, Father God, with you. So we give you praise. We give you glory. Now, Father God, protect us as we go home. Protect us in our sleep, Father God. Watch over us, God, and let us be a shining light in our workplaces and in our in our day-to-day -day activities. So we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, and we pray for our shepherds at, because they're coming back on Friday. So we pray, Father God, for traveling grace. We pray that the... That the uh, that the, the jet streams over, over and above us would be smooth sailing from them all the way home. That there would be no issues from, from the hotel all the way to the airports and everything in between. And we thank you, Father God. 
because our pastors are coming back. In Jesus' name, amen.